Entonces, um, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Flavia Belpoliti y junto con mi colega Jocely Mainers tenemos el enorme gusto de trabajar con el proyecto de TEX, uh, que significa um, Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish. Y uh, básicamente tenemos distintas actividades a lo largo del año y tenemos la muy buena suerte de cerrar este 2022 con este último webinar con la presencia de la doctora Elena Follis y la doctora Stacy Alex, que nos van a dar una presentación, creo, muy interesante sobre eh, los libros de OER y el desarrollo que ellas llevaron a cabo para crear su, su propio libro. Entonces a quienes ya nos acompañan desde hace tiempo, conocen nuestras, nuestras metas y nuestra misión, que es básicamente ayudar a diseminar y a desarrollar todos aquellos programas que trabajen con estudiantes de español como lengua de herencia, y tenemos la suerte de contar con colaboradores de distintas universidades de la región, y especialmente tenemos también el apoyo y el entusiasmo de muchísimos instructores en todo, en todo el país, que eh, de alguna manera colaboran, participan y están al tanto de nuestras actividades. Joseli, no sé si quieres añadir algo más sobre TEX antes de continuar. Yo creo que no, ya estamos. Este, vamos a darle la palabra a nuestras presentadoras. Yo creo que primero, Flavia, las vas a... Uh -huh, uh -huh. Perfecto, entonces um, de nuevo es un gusto recibirlas a, a las dos aquí en esta uh, sala virtual. Eh, Elena Follis is Assistant Professor of Texas A&M in San Antonio and has been directing a uh, oral history project, the oral narrative of Latinas, Latinos in Ohio since 2014. Uh, the project is an ongoing collection of um, video narratives Uh, and you can find some of them in her iBook. And please, if we can share the link, uh, it will be fantastic. So you can take a look. Um, she explores uh, in her research Latino voices through oral history and performance, identity, and place, uh, basically with ethnographic approach and, of course, family stories. Uh, she's also the host of a fantastic podcast. I mean, I follow most of the stories, and I think that. Everybody will enjoy those uh, Latino stories. Um, and that's an extension of, of, her, uh, of her oral project. Uh, so basically, the podcast invites audience to connect and learn more about the Latino communities and their experiences uh, while amplifying the voices of the community everywhere. So even if it's based on Ohio, their voices resonate with many experiences uh, in, 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 our, in our, all our, our contexts. Uh, she's a very engaged scholar and is committed to reaching non-academic and academia audiences through her writing, presentations, and public humanities projects. And now, welcome uh, Stacy as well. She's also an assistant professor of Spanish at Morningside University in Sioux City, Iowa. Uh, so she's joining us from, from there. <laughs> she enjoys teaching a variety of classes on language and culture, Spanish for the professions, and Latinx communities in the US. She also directed the creation of the uh, online oral history project, Latin Stories of Suxland. Uh, in her research, she examined how Latinos communities create a sense of belonging through cultural and narrative resistance in the face of racialization, resulting from the US immigration policies that we are all aware, uh, and also the effects of the media and educational institutions in this, uh, in this uh, racialization process. She also researches Latin American and Latinas uh, pop culture, identity policies, and gender and sexuality through radio, children's games, folklore, and literature. Uh, she has taught in middle school and also high school, so she has a broad experience with different mm -hmm. contexts, and uh, she participated in dual language programs uh, in West Liberty, in Iowa. So ladies, welcome. We're very happy to have you here today. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, find my place here, wait, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> and um, the oral history that you just mentioned um, that Stacy is directing um, just uh, was mentioned in a 
an article, a local article. So Stacy, you should uh, share those links to in the chat. Um, so, um, so yeah, uh, we uh, thank you, Fl uh, Flavia, for introducing and just a little bit about ourselves. We um, we published this book in 2019, and we you know took advantage of a couple of uh, resources right that 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 we had at Ohio State. We both were in Ohio at Ohio State during that time. And we kept thinking about uh, ways that we could build something that was really reflective of the students' experiences in the Midwest. Um, at that time, uh, we were in the process of creating a curriculum uh, for heritage language learners. And while we had a writing course or like a more advanced course, we sort of started backwards, right? We started creating a 2000 level course and then the 1000 level course. And for that, particular course, which is uh, what the book uses, we wanted, we kept looking for books, right? What, what would be appropriate? What we do, uh, do we want to use for this course? And, and, and I said to Stacey, which I miss collaborating, just, I mean, we still collaborate. I miss collaborating with her, just like coming, you know, being in the office together and talking. But we decided we wanted to create something that um, was very centered in the Midwest. We had a lot of publications that um, um, sort of talk about the Midwest, but it was centered around the Chicago experience or just Illinois, right? And so uh, we wanted to create a, something that was more uh, broad um, and that went into those communities where our students were coming from, right? So. Even though most of the students were from Ohio, um, maybe it was easier for them to relate to those experiences in Iowa or in Kansas or you know things um, sort of like those regions or those states. Um, so we wanted uh, most of us to see, most of all, we wanted them to see their experiences represented in the curriculum, um, growing up bilingual and bicultural in a place um, you know, like in a, in a city in the Midwest. Um, we also wanted to um, extend or expand our understanding of Latino diversity um, across the Midwest. Um, I, I often talk about, you know, now, especially now that I'm in Texas, right? Um, here I have a large uh, Latinx community, primarily Mexican American, right? In, in Ohio, where I was there, I had a much smaller community, but it was very diverse. Uh, so let's say 10 students, you know, but I had uh, Mexican, Mexican American, Puerto Rican, uh, Central Americans, uh, some uh, from uh, South America. So, you know, so, so those experiences, um, I, I, we wanted the students to see that, right, to, to understand themselves. Um, in relation to those other groups around them. Um, and we wanted to make a book that was project-based. Um, and so we wanted to incorporate, and you'll see if you uh, have taken a look at the book, but you'll have a book we'll um, show a little bit today. Um, there is um, a sequence to each of the chapters that sort of culminates into, um, you know, this, this um, broader uh, project-based um, product at the end of the, of the book. Uh, but we, you know, along the way, we have them um, use their, their, their creative or their creativity um, so where they could write uh, poems that um, reflect their identity in any way that they want to, um, to express it. Um, uh, Stacy is a fan of Loteria visual art. So, you know, we incorporated something like that that students might be able to relate to. Uh, we definitely wanted to take advantage of digital archives that are already available to us. So, uh, the project that Flavia um, uh, mentioned, right, the uh, Oral Histories of Latinos in Ohio, is incorporated into this, uh, this book, uh, the Latino Stories. Uh, podcast is incorporated in this book, but then um, you see here on the screen the Listening to Puerto Rico uh, archive, uh, 
that was built in collaboration with, collaboration with the University of Notre, Notre Dame in Michigan. And then we have our colleague Isabel Velasquez in uh, Nebraska with her wonderful family letters. Um, so we wanted to, and, and many more, uh, but we wanted to make sure that those archives that are, are already there, um, you know, we took advantage of it. We wanted to create something that was affordable, that was open, an open educational resource um, textbook. And um, Ohio State um, a few years ago had this call, right, for us to design books that were low cost or uh, free. And so, you know, we took advantage of um, sort of that help, um, technical help that the university um, and the platform, right, the WordPress and um, I created another book that used uh, iBooks. Um, so taking advantage of those platforms to create uh, books that would be um, free for our students. So, you know, in addition to having sort of this type of book, we wanted to really make our, our classes more affordable. We all know how much the textbooks cost, and sometimes they're necessary, right? We do, I do like to have the textbooks and the manuals, but we also wanted something where the students had more um, interaction, like there was more in interactivity, there was a little bit more um, sort of innovation, um, current, you know, um, uh, tools that they can use um, in the classroom and so their work with technology as well. Um, we wanted to um, show, and I think an open educational resources has that potential of showing um, sort of our Latino or Latinx community um, doing work that is um, important to our community, but it also talks about our legacy, right? For uh, looking back of, of our le legacy and then where, where we, how we move forward, right? With our students and, and uh, applying that to our current environment. Uh, so we wanted our students to see that as well and to get to know their own communities, right? Because we go from sort of Midwest context to local context. Uh, we have students that uh, get to know their community, attend local festivals, um, and that's part of you know, this, um, you know, this uh, textbook. It encourages that kind of um, activities or engagement with the students. Um, and so, um, again, most, most of all, we wanted them to see reflected um, in the curriculum that we were using. And I have to say that um, I was able to teach this course one. Um, we had another instructor that also taught it and we taught it on, online. And it was, it, it was sort of, you know, it, was, it, it worked just really good. It was during the pandemic, so we had to do it this way, but it worked just perfectly, right? Um, and the students, um, you know, a lot of the students were very, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Como se dice? Se expresaron mucho, ¿no? Sobre having never had a book that really reflected, you know, their, um, their story or their experiences growing up Latino, growing up bilingual. So it was, it was rewarding for me to hear uh, that the students really felt connected and appreciated um, this work. Um, so Stacey, did you want to um, say comments? Is this my part? I got it. Nope. Okay. <laughs> it has been a while since I've zoomed. Okay. I guess I'll click. Okay. Um, here's a list of our chapters. Um, and like Elena said, we really wanted to dive deep into topics that were going to be culturally relevant to our students. Um, and again, you're going to have a chance to look at one of the chapters in particular at the end. Um, and then on the next slide, Elena, I have the sequence that we follow for each chapter. And so it's very much parallel structure for each one. Um, and, you know, Elena has really been my mentor and has invited me um, on this journey with her. Um, and I owe her a lot. But, you know, I was a second language learner, right? Um, I'm not a heritage learner myself. So I had a lot to learn, right, about um, the experiences of my children, even, you know, my children and my, you know, nieces and nephews are all heritage learners, but I hadn't gone through this myself, right? So, 
you know, what, what I learned through training, you know, that we took in, in California was that, you know, what we really want, you know, with our second language learners, we often start with a uh, text because it's less intimidating, right? For, for us to not have to speak and listen, right? At the beginning of a class. And, but it's really the opposite, right? For our heritage language learners. And so Elena has um, put together really wonderful multimedia um, to open up each chapter, right? So that's very inviting and, and very much um, hopefully um, going to make them feel comfortable, right? To really dive in um, with, with listening, right? Which is probably the, um, what they're most comfortable with. Um, so we have questions before, during, and after they view that piece. Some are, are interviews, some are podcasts. Um, and then there's um, some grammar work, right? Um, and a lot of this is very flexible, right? You can structure it how you how you need to in your own classroom, right? Um, and then and then we get to the reading, right? The reading comes second. Um, they're very short texts, as you're going to see, um, and that's you know per on purpose, right? Um, because this is a kind of an introductory course. Um, but we do have lots of extension, right? Where depending on where your students are at you can add on as much as you'd like, right? And, and so I really think that the flexibility is really um, what's wonderful about, about this collection. And then again, like, like Elena said, we end with that project. So. Mm -hmm. And the book was created, um, uh, you know, we thought it was uh, going to be for um, so beginner um, uh, level heritage language um, class. Um, so not, um, yeah, yeah, so let, let's leave it at that. But the extension uh, pieces that come after the reading um, can really um, be adaptable to different levels, um, to maybe even more advanced uh, levels. So uh, I think that's one of the things that's unique. Of this. Like it, it lets you pick and choose what might be a little bit more appropriate for your students or for the, the level uh, of your students. Um, and, and the class that you're teaching. Um, so this is some, of our, some of the examples, right? So we um, we have uh, the podcast that's included. Um, you might you might see it as Ohio Habla, which was the title of the podcast. And then um, a, a year ago, last year, I changed it to Latino Stories to reflect really um, the uh, the type of interviews that uh, that are um, in that podcast, which is not just about Ohio. Um, and, and then um, we have here the example of, um, wait, is this is from the Iowa archive? Yeah, um, the, the, the migration is, well, sorry. The, um, the, 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 the Grant Wood, the, one yeah, in the, the middle one. Yeah, that's, um, uh, it's called the Latinx Midwest, the piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that it's off of uh, the Grant Woods um, famous um, painting from Iowa. Right, right. Um, so, so those, you know, those um, sort of different archives that are already available and accessible um, to to us, we incorporated into the book, and we design um, either discussion questions or um, activities, grammar, vocabulary activities um, into the to the book. Um, that reflected sort of that reading or that that audio um, or video that they that they saw. Um, and so Stacey and I currently are working on, a, on an article. And one of the things, and I just want to read this out loud because it's very important to us to think about ways that um, we incorporate things that really speak to our students and our students' experiences. And, and I'll just read this. Um, as educators invested in developing anti-racist curriculums, we can invite students to engage with digital archives in ways that ask them to directly confront the racialized erasure of these stories and official narratives. The inclusion of oral history archives and mode is most transformative when, we, when they are used to analyze how the stories people tell about themselves, including their cultural practices, traditions, language, et cetera, reveal specificities about their communities that are often lost or ignored by dominant narratives. And, and a lot of us that do this work and that work with heritage language learners know that many of our students come um, 
not really um, thinking about their own sort of community knowledge or their or family knowledge as places of uh, rich history, right? Uh, as, as stories uh, that we can learn from. And then having them really think and engage in the stories in the classroom sort of brings a different sort of understanding of our own um, you know, contributions into the, the, you know, the history of the United States or of our communities. Um, and, and there are so many good archives out there that, that are doing um, this. And so how do we make sure that those archives are being used and our students are interacting with it? Um, what, taking advantage, full advantage of everything that Ohio State had to offer, we decided that we also wanted to incorporate grammar videos that um, so we you know there are sort of grammar um, focus um, on each of the chapters and uh, but we we didn't want to spend too much time in the classroom right we wanted to give them um, and sort of like the flip uh, classroom model where they can go and view those videos multiple times if they need to um, and um, and review sort of those those grammar points. Um, so the OSU has a, a Lightroom and we, we went there and sort of you know explain and we'll show you just briefly uh, one of the one of the videos. Um, but but here students, you know, we still try to incorporate the, the vocabulary from the chapter with the examples that we're that we're doing in our explanations of grammar. Um, and um, and then after those videos that are embedded into the, the textbook, we have sort of grammar exercises. And those are very self-check, right, uh, grammar exercises uh, that they can work on. And if, you know, for me, for homework, I'm like, I want the, the screenshot that says you got them all right. I don't care how long it took you to get them all right. Um, because what's important to me is that you're practicing, you're learning, right? Um, and so, so students sort of that's how they completed some of the assignments. Um, and I'll show you. Oh well, I'll show you one of the grammar um, uh, videos here in a minute. Is there anything else you want to say about this, Stacy? Okay, um, so this was at Ohio State. It was uh, taught or used in the Spanish 1113 classroom, um, which is in uh, a beginner um, class. Um, again, uh, the, the book uh, focuses on cultural competency, uh, storytelling, projects, grammar, and vocabulary. Uh, we also wanted to, to make it where students um, uh, so um, for older generations and younger generations, for example, there's two um, oral histories about university students. So that was very relatable to some, to some of our students, right? Uh, and we also, some of the activities that they had to do, right, um, is to go out into their community and document what's out there, what's, you know, where do we find uh, Latino foods or the foods of our families, right? Where do we find this? Um, do we have to go to a special section and, you know, the, at the grocery, the regular grocery store, or do we have to go to like Mexican stores or Latino stores um, that carry that, those products? And so students had fun. So a lot of times we encouraged them to go in pairs or in groups. They didn't have to go alone. Um, and so, since this class is more online, it was also a way for them to like build community, right? Because uh, we were in meeting in person, so a lot of them went in um, in groups of two or three and took pictures, um, and then they had to write a little bit about them. Um, so here's an example: we had two students, right, that were um, interviewed and had their oral history, and they talk about sort of growing up. One more about growing up in Ohio, another one um, about coming, sort of like uh, the tradition of uh, coming to Ohio State, but um, they're both um, uh, speaking in Spanish, and you can also hear sort of their different 
um, ways of speaking. One is um, of her uh, Puerto Rican heritage in this particular example. One is of uh, Mexican heritage. So all of those things, right, are we discuss those things in the classroom as well. Um, some other projects that the students have to do, uh, some were, um, you know, they could do sort of research online. Um, and some, uh, for example, when I taught this particular course, um, the Latino festival, which, which usually um, comes in August, uh, was actually in September that year. So it was perfect because I'm like, okay, you all can go. Uh, it, it was during the semester and a lot of them win. Um, I wanna say about 90% of the class win um, and so they took, you know, pictures, they, they, and then they had sort of like a short reflection about um, the, the local festival. Some of them um, wrote about different um, festivals, uh, either in their community or they sort of researched. Um, so those are some of the projects that they did. Um, again, some examples of the videos that we created, um, and I'll play a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we did before I play it is that we wanted to also, um, in our, the people that did the, um, the videos, we wanted to have different accents. So we had people, you know, like um, Christian that's from Spain, me from Mexico, we had uh, Palo that's from Peru, um, I forget the other person's name, but he was El Salvador. Uh, and Stacy, right, as a, as a second language, um, honorary Latina, also in there, right? <laughs> uh, so we wanted also to the students to be exposed, right, to different speeds, accents, ways of um, speaking as well. So I'll just take a little bit. Y en general, a personas a las que queremos guardar deferencia. I mean, we had fun doing this too, right? Because we thought it was pretty cool to use this Lightroom, and the students too thought. That Así was que vamos cool a imaginar que estamos great. en la en el Festival Latino y tenemos un puesto de comida y vamos a preguntar. Vamos a tener una pregunta de una persona que nos dice, disculpe. ¿Dónde pago la cuenta? So along with those videos and the book, you'll find uh, a document that has um, more examples and grammar information. And then, um, like I mentioned before, in the book itself, you have uh, grammar exercises. Um, this is some um, other examples. We have them talk about food um, and the things that they like to do. So we were talking about, you know, the, the verb like gusta and all of that. And so we took advantage also of the students' creativity or like already being on TikTok. Um, I have to say that some some of our students, as you might know, are consumers of social media, so social media, but not necessarily creators. So some of them, we had to guide them a little bit, right? Like how to how to create a YouTube, you know, a, a TikTok video, which I'm not an expert, but I'm like, <laughs> you know, just a, just do a little video. Uh, it doesn't, you know, I'm not I'm not expecting like, um, you know, this um, terrific uh, skills. I just want you to, uh, you know, do the task however you think it might be more engaging. And really, they had a lot of fun. They did more than we thought they would do. Um, and, um, and it was fun to see the transition because they, they had some of the assignments require them to record themselves or to um, either record a reflect, reflection or answer questions verbally. Um, so there's a lot of practice there, right? And so we could see too as instructors sort of the confidence that they had at the beginning of the semester and how that advanced into um, you know, sort of the end of the semester, uh, just being more comfortable. Along with that, um, both Pablo and I had a video um, at the beginning of the week where we sort of introduced the topic or what we were gonna be working on the, some, the, you know, uh, for that week. And I think that also created this um, 
um, ease, right? The, the instructor is making videos, so it's okay if we make videos, right? Or I don't know, it just uh, created this sense of, um, um, like I always say, I don't ask students to do something that I haven't done myself. Uh, so if I'm asking them to do an introductory video, then I'm doing one myself too, right? Uh, not only as an example, but also um, sort of to show that I can do this too, right? I'm asking you to do something that I'm willing to do myself. Um, so uh, the example that you have here and thinking about the different institutions or the different uh, regions maybe, um, or the types of students that you have or levels. Um, I was thinking about sort of, and Stacey has other examples for you, uh, but just a quick example for example uh, that has to do with the region. Um, the first or second chapter in our uh, textbook uh, has a video about La Historia de la Villita in Chicago. Uh, and, and it's a short video that the students sort of hear about the origin. Um, and then since I'm in San Antonio, there's a, uh, they're doing a lot of work uh, documenting the west side of San Antonio. Um, and sort of the work um, that they do, that they have done um, here for generations. And there's a video about that. Um, and so I showed, um, you know, the video in comparison to uh, the video at La Villita, right? And um, sort of to, to create the sense of like, this is, you know, what, what's happening in Chicago, but this is what we have here locally. Um, so to me, uh, this is a, uh, not all, not, it's not just replacing, right, uh, the story of the or, El Origen del Barrio de la Villita, but it allows us to do comparisons, right? How are they documenting that? And how, what does that uh, neighborhood look like? And what does the neighborhood here locally of San Antonio look like? And what kind of work um, are they doing to sort of preserve that history? Um, so I'll let, um, and I, we'll open it up to questions later on, but I'll let Stacey um, speak of more examples. Yeah, so um, we have uh, Migration is Beautiful, which is uh, an archive from the University of Iowa. And it's included in our book, but just a very small snippet. We actually use it like as part of a grammar activity. Um, so, you know, in my classes, I really um, latch on to that collection and expand on it. Um, we only have one person from our town represented in that archive, um, but I make sure that she is represented because the look in my students' eyes, right, when they realize that, oh, wait, we had Latinos here before, like, when my family got here, you know, it, it's, they're, they're so surprised, right, to understand that, that we're talking about more than 100 years of history, right? Um, so I think that really, it really helps them, you know, appreciate um, the historical context. Um, and then this, this one in particular talks about her experience with racism, right? So it makes, you know, we talk about racism in terms of theory, right? Um, but bringing a real life example to them often helps them open up, right? And to being able to talk about um, either their own experiences or, you know, um, you know, connect, connect with um, the, the, text. So I do want to mention that I teach a couple of gen eds, general education courses, and they, they're taught in English, right, because it's not just Spanish students. So um, luckily, this is uh, available bilingually, right? Um, most of the interviews are actually done in English, but were translated into Spanish by a University of Iowa students. So you, it works either way. Um, it's a really wonderful collection. And then on the next slide, Elena, um, because I teach these general education classes, um, I, I'm usually pulling from all the bilingual things, right? So I, I do wanna point out this Kansas State Archive is also bilingual. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, collection of old um, newsletters. Um, you know, little little information about LULAC and political organizing in Kansas. Um, and so I, I tie this into my, my gen ed class. Um, and then, you know, we can talk from after they have a chance to look at it. But I do wanna make sure that my, my heritage students, my heritage students um, in that class see themselves as really having an incredible deal of, of um, cultural wealth, which is something that Elena and I use in our research, right? Uh, we use Tar Tara Yosa's 2005 cultural wealth model. Um, so I really wanna position students 
um, that have grown up with Spanish as um, you know, having all of this social capital and linguistic capital, right? That only them can provide, right? Um, and, and so we talk a lot about epistemology, right? Who owns the knowledge? What counts as knowledge, right? Um, and that I really wanna position the, our local um, and regional um, Latinx communities as producers of knowledge. Um, so we can do that through these texts, we can do that through our conversation. Um, they also interview um, Latinx community members, you know, that are that are on campus. And then on the next slide, I think I just have one more example from a, a gen ed. So this is a May term. Uh, we travel across Iowa. We go to a different town every week. Um, and I, I took this right from our textbook and just slightly modified it, right? Um, so we're, we're, they collaboratively build this map. Um, but again, you know, positioning student heritage learners as, as um, crucial, right? In a lot of cases, they were the only ones that were able to uh, interview the people that we went out to, to meet, right? Um, because we did we didn't meet with several people who were um, Spanish language dominant, right? So those students were really at the forefront of that project and making sure that we got to hear their stories. Um, so let's see, I'm sorry, you can't scroll down. It's just a picture of it, but is that the last one, Elena? Is there, did I include the, okay, yep. Oh, you're on mute, Elena. Sorry, I'll mute myself. I just feel like <laughs> <laughs> um, so. So yeah, so this book um, has been, and, and I don't know if they, uh, if you know about this, Stacey, but several uh, people have contacted me about using the book. Um, I've uh, facilitated, like I provided, um, I share the. Um, syllabus that we use for the, you know, Ohio State class, but, but what I learned from people using the book, they, um, they are able to adapt, you know, according to the region. Um, I know somebody from George Washington University um, is using the book, and she just made some um, sort of changes to, to make it a little more relevant to, uh, to the, you know, to that base, um, and I have heard from other uh, professors or instructors that um, just pick for that one or two chapters of that book and um, you know and teach that or or uh, use that particular um, you know um, chapter for for the class. Um, this, I mean, it's it's written in Spanish, um, but like uh, Stacy said, some of the items that are there are bilingual, so that you can see them or view them or hear them both in English or in Spanish. Um, and so you can even uh, incorporate some of the work that we that is found in this um, textbook um, uh, for our Latino studies class, for example, right? Um, so, so yeah, um, that's, I wanted to show you, uh, not, we don't have, we were thinking we were gonna have um, more people, but we, I'm going to stop sharing right now and I want to show you a little bit. How many of you, if you can sort of raise your hand, um, how many of you have taken, have been able to take a look at the, at the book? Before. Okay. Uh, have you, Nina, have you used any uh, of it or how have you used it? Yes, so I was dying to meet you both because <laughs> I used the book last fall when I at the University of South Carolina, Nina Moreno, mm -hmm. and we revived the heritage Spanish as a heritage language uh, program <laughs> mm -hmm. that had been dead for about 18 or so years before I even joined the university. And I wanted to teach the course with an OER. I found your book and I skipped some chapters, but it worked wonderfully because as you said, it's very adaptable. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did at the end is use the last few weeks to, to adapt chapter six, which is Latinos in Ohio, and mm -hmm. we made it Latinos in South Carolina. Yeah. So that became a super project-based final project where they came up with their own readings, all based on what you guys did. So I've always given you credit mm -hmm. and we put it up on a wiki 
on our Blackboard site. So I was just so excited that we had that resource and I'm, I wanna keep using it because it's worked out wonderfully. That's a great idea, right? Of how to, uh, so yeah, the chapter that is about Latinos in Ohio, how do we adapt that? I mean, I, I would not, I like the idea of like using the, that book here now that I'm in San Antonio and uh, transforming that chapter into um, Latinos or Mexican Americans or whatever the class decides in uh, San Antonio, right? And what would that be? Is there resources already out there that we could, like if we build the chapter as a class from scratch, can, how do, what do we replace this with, right? Um, and so that's a, that's a great uh, way to adapt that, right? Um, so I just, uh, for those of you that haven't seen the book, um, I'll uh, briefly show you. Um, and you do have it, I think Michael um, added it, added it to the chat. Uh, so you do have the link. Um, so if you go to the website, if you, um, so you can go to the content, let me go to home. Yeah. So home takes you to this page and you actually can scroll down. You can download the book and it'll give you a PDF, but um, some of the links either don't work or it'll take you outside of the book. So, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages, but uh, you also have the option of downloading the book. And if you scroll down, you'll see all the contents you have and all the chapters, right, uh, follow the same structure. We have an introduction, which also can be, there's a lot of activities in there um, to get the students ready for the book or for thinking about their community and their own, uh, like Stacey said, um, you know, wealth, community wealth. Um, cultural wealth, et cetera. Um, and then um, you have each of the, the chapters. So I'll go through one um, just to show you uh, what it looks like. Latinos and me, Universidad, and we, and this is all like Stacey and I writing and thinking about the, the uh, objectives, uh, the learning objectives. Uh, we created the, the, uh, questions, all the content that you see here was split, right? And uh, between um, Stacey and I, and uh, the, so in this particular uh, chapter, you have the oral history of Victoria Colleen. Uh, we have the questions after that, then you see the, the video, the grammar video. Uh, here you can download the document that gives them just a little more explanation about it. Um, and then you have the, um, the exercises and so in some they have to type in the word um, in some um, let's see if I go down uh, some activities I'm trying not to scroll, scroll too fast because I know okay this one doesn't this is all um, you type in the word um, but in some exercises you just kind of drag and um, and drop. And so that's also fun. So oh, that's like this one, right? So I'm not even reading, so they're probably wrong. But you know, you, the students can just drag and drop, and then they check. And it doesn't give them the answers, but it tells them whether they're right or wrong, so they can try it again. Um, so, um, so yeah. So we luckily had uh, some of the activities, some of the technical. We had some technical support from the university, but we also had technical support from Stacey's partner uh, who helped us um, uh, design some of the activities as well. Uh, but yeah, what you see here. So one of the things that I'm thinking about, um, um, so you have the readings and um, the extensions at the bottom, uh, where, where, so this first chapter also focuses a lot um, on at Ohio State for the um, information, but you can definitely say, well, what's at our, our university, right? And, and what do we have here? What resources do we have for Latino students? What organizations are? So it really sends them out into, you know, to get to know their environment. Um, I'll just show you the last um, part of this, which is the proyecto. So, Every at the end of each chapter, there, there's a proyecto, right? And so they, and it starts small, you know, they do some 
research, and then they tried it. We tried to make them incorporate some of the grammar or the language that we were using. Uh, and as you can see, they're short, short descriptions, right? 100 to 150 words. Um, and then they provide us with a short description. Sometimes um, in some of the exercises we have, oh, the proyectos are, have, to do, have to be uh, done verbally. Um, so that, again, that continual um, uh, practice of language in different forms. Um, so what I was going to say is that this particular chapter, right, I'm at an institution now, and I think about it, how am I going to adopt this, right? Because my institution has a very diverse uh, student body. So I have parents, right? I have adults. I have uh, veterans. There is a military friendly institution. So I don't have the typical sort of 18 to 20 year old, not, it's not the majority in my class. So how do I, so that first chapter that's, that's talking about getting to know your university, how do I make it in a way where my students who are older, I don't feel, I don't know. <laughs> um, that, that's, that, that reflects their experience, right? As adult people who have children, right? Uh, so maybe it's something to do with, is there, is there resources for students who are parents and, and what does that look like, right? So I'm thinking about how I could even change it to my uh, new context here, which includes different types of students, right? Um, so, so yeah, so I don't know, um, uh, since we have a small uh, group, Joseli, if we want to do breakout uh, room uh, or if we want to have maybe open it up for questions and, and comments. It's up to you if you think, it, yeah, there's not too many of us, so we can all stay together if you want. That would be great. So um, um, Nina said she has used it and, and sort of told us a way that she has adapted um the chapter which i i love that example because i think i'm definitely gonna i'm gonna do that um uh here right so to take one chapter and make it regional to our area that's a great way of adapting that book uh and you already have a model right and can have that freedom of creating and looking and you know what what would best represent their community in that way um is there somebody else here that has used the book or has questions? Yanni? That's it. I have two questions, but I kind of wanted to wait till the end because mine are right now are like technical questions or maybe I can ask them, I'm not sure. Yeah. Because um, you mentioned um, that you moved when you and Stacy created the, mm -hmm. put together the materials, mm -hmm. uh, but after that you moved to another university. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions about that and about users of the book somewhere else. One has to do with the homework um, and how do uh, the students type in, you show that mm -hmm. the students type in the, the answers. How, um, so one can check for completion. Did you do it? Did you not do it? Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned you look for getting all of them right. Right. Ha, mm -hmm. is there um for someone who's not part who doesn't own the I'm not sure how to phrase this, but how does doesn't own the textbook? How does one see the I have access to the answers or to the scores or how does that work? So the book is available to anybody. If you have a computer, you can you can see it online on the page. So you can do all that work on the page. Um, and what, what I asked them to do is to, once they complete it, to do a screenshot and then they upload it on their learning man management system. So we okay. have Canvas and, you know, in Ohio State. And so that's what they did. And so that was the points that were assigned to them. Okay. So that was sort of like a quick check yeah. for them. Yeah, but then, we, you also can have them do more like writing uh, and that's their, you know, themselves writing it or their, uh, we had a lot of uh, homework where I, I had them record themselves, uh, you know, describing something or reflecting on something. 
Um, so that was another way that was that I was um, encouraging sort of that practice, right? Um, so so yeah, that that was. And I have another question. Um, I noticed in the link it says, um, I believe it says Ohio or mm -hmm. the name of the university where it, this was created. Mm -hmm. Once you move to another place, because sometimes we stay at a, the same university, same institution for a while, and it's mm -hmm. fine. We keep having access to it. Are you still able to modify, to work on them, to add, having left? Yeah, I made sure that I could. <laughs> so I switched all my email, you know, because it was attached to my Ohio State email, but I switched. You can switch to, to your personal email. Um, so that you can have access and go and edit. Um, so the yeah, so any so Stacy can go also and edit if she if, if we see something or if we want to update something, uh, we can go and edit for sure. But let's, so let's be do, real. It's it's going to be my husband who fixes it, not me. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, if you find anything, we can just tell him to fix it. So right, right. And we have, like, we had, I had a friend that um, used the book in Illinois at Bradley University. Um, and I asked her to please, like, keep track of any mistakes she saw. And she had a few for us, uh, you know, either typos or, you know, things like that. Um, and so we went and fixed those. Christian, Christian had the list and he, and he um, fixed those. Um, so we, you know, we are, yeah, there, there might be mistakes. So we just want to know and so we can fix it, right? Um, and so, yeah, I made sure that I had access. Um, so that's, I, I will always, we will always have access to that um, so we can update. And I don't want to take up all of your questions for the answers, but that was actually my last question. I am um, speaking to someone recently. Um, how I, the concept looks great, wonderful, very inspiring. Um, um, I'm trying to also do something where we talk about, um, there's a unit called, uh, that we call Mi Comunidad. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more to explore that um, I think it's wonderful to see that you dedicated the, actually the entire book to that, mm -hmm. to the community. I mean, that, that's really amazing. And, but um, in, in talking to someone a couple of weeks ago uh, about open access, people feel differently. Of course, we feel very good about the concept, others not so good. Um, so the person was asking me questions about, well, or saying things like, um, what about the quality? Is this peer, like, is, are these materials reviewed, peer reviewed? Mm -hmm. um, have you ever, um, had to answer that question and what would um what is your um answer I, to that yeah, i haven't had to answer that question specifically like not, nobody has asked me this question so i'm glad that you did because i can i so there are ways for open educational resources to be peer review for sure uh there are uh platforms that you can specifically submit i actually peer reviewed um a an open educational um textbook that I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it was for second language learner. Um, and so I reviewed that. So there is a way for you to, to send it out for peer review. What we did, Stacey and I, is that we send it to some of the sort of, you know, big names and heritage language, uh, uh, research, you know, teaching and learning uh, for them to review. Um, and we had Sarah Boudry to write for the, that preface, right? That, that sort of dedicated preface, preface to the book. Um, because we wanted to make sure that what we were doing was also, you know, using best practices for heritage language learners. Um, and so there is ways to have any open educational resource tech be peer review for sure. Um, and so in our, in our um, experience or in, in, in our process, we send it out uh, to people to, to review. Um, it wasn't blind. Uh, in our case, it wasn't a blind peer review, but we definitely send it out to people like Glenn Martinez, Diego uh, Pascual, Damian Wilson, Sarah um, to review. So. Um, but yeah, there are there are ways to have it peer review. So the quality is there uh, for those that are 
creating open educational resources. Um, Can I jump yes. in one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Jessica. I just wanted to point out that in on our uh, website, the Texas Coalition for Heritage Spanish, we have started implementing a new review process as well, so that whoever creates uh, an OER and wants to share it, then we ask several people to review it. We have a rubric that we use. Mm -hmm. And so then we give feedback and we uh, help the person uh, improve their resource before we mm -hmm. share it. So, mm -hmm. and, and then this I is think, what you did for our, our book too, right? When we submitted it to you, you reviewed it. And so there should, I think we should work on um, having kind of an official seal that it's been reviewed because mm -hmm. when people ask you this, you know, there should be a way on your website on your book to show that so uh, that's Sam, yeah or something yeah yeah but um but yeah i, I, I can think. add mm -hmm, i can add to that and this, that's the process i've been hearing from other other uh, groups that of, of course i mean they're beautiful materials but it's always well this is not a formal published book so how do you know about that so i think the question is is really relevant and i believe that the spirit of oer is that everyone has to share and participate so everyone of you here today are invited to apply to be our one of our reviewers we have like a small form and and also the fact that i mean slowly i think that we need to start doing uh reviews and publish the reviews as we do reviews in for Polish books. I'm doing one now. So I think why don't we have in Hispania or in the Modern Language Association uh, review journal, why don't we have more reviews done with these materials? That's something that the, the academia has to pick up at some point. So mm -hmm. that's something else to, to think about. Yeah. Um... There's also a way for you to, there's a library and I can't, I don't, I don't remember all the details right at this moment, but there is a library that you, that um, you can submit your textbooks uh, or books that are OERs and they put them up on their website too. And they, and that they go through a process of review. Like you submit the book and they also review it. Um, before they put it, they add it to their website. So there are different ways to like really make your work um, certifiable, I guess, um, valid, certifiable. And there um, is a movement to have, uh, you know, this public publication process as OER. There's a movement to make it more for more awareness and make it more of a part of like tenure and uh, promotion. Processes. So it's not easy. I mean, Stacy and I, you know, Stacy, what do you think? Is this work? <laughs> how, did, how long did it take us? It was a while. Yeah. 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 It was fun though, because I got to do it with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's fun and it's rewarding, but it, it is work. We had to write like all the content that you see there, we wrote, right? And then mm -hmm. we included things that were already available, but we definitely wrote a lot of that stuff. Thank you. Well, mm -hmm. I don't want to take up our time. Is it is six or no? Are we going to sixteen? I just wanted to mention that I. <laughs> sorry, Joselle. I, I, I work at a predominantly white institution, um, but this dominantly white institution, predominantly white, um, is very much interested in recruiting from our majority Spanish-speaking communities, right? Like every other institution, uh, which is great, right? As long as we're not, you know, monetizing. Um, our communities. So um, it, I was, I think that we're going to actually be able to offer this course um, as part of that recruitment effort, right? Um, but also a retention effort, right? To start building community before our students get here um, so that they they have that, that community before day one. So I'm, I'll keep you posted, but I'm hoping that that's going to happen over the summer before freshman year. So. <laughs> Are there any other questions before we leave? I think Philomena raised her hand. Not a question. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for all of your work and, and for this wonderful presentation. And we do, I'm from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, and we do have a track in uh, for Spanish for heritage students, um, but we also have one in uh, Korean and Chinese. So your work will inform I work at the Language Resource Center consulting with faculty. So your work will inform 
um, our work with those colleagues and those students, and also in the Indian languages. I've been working with um, a teacher of uh, Punjabi. I'm very, I'm, it was very affirming. I was glad to hear uh, she also has asks her students uh, to engage with the community, interview uh, people in the community in the language. They just made podcasts mm. of um, those interviews. So not necessarily an oral history project, but thank you very much. And your work has already, um, will uh, expand beyond uh, Espanol también. Thank you. So, thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs> The other thing I was thinking about, um, and this is a very old project um, out of Arizona, I think it used to be called, um, oh, it doesn't matter what it was called, but it's a good 10 years old of connecting um, the students who are using your text in other in different cities. So what does mm -hmm. it mean to be Latino or Latina, Latinx in Arizona and connecting those students with students in New York City? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember and, that project, but I can't remember. Yeah, yeah I've heard it. Circulos or Hispanidades. And then, then they changed the name. So that's why I'm also mm -hmm. having, yeah. having trouble, but thinking about those, the larger network and mm -hmm. um, students connecting with each other about their life experiences and, and their communities. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good night, everybody. Good night. Nina, please send yes. us, if you can, uh, the work that your students did. I, I will. And thank you again so much. I'm fangirling over here. So <laughs> great meeting you all and keep up the good work. Thank and before you. everybody goes, I'm going to share a QR code for a short survey. If you could please uh, take a couple minutes. Uh, let me see. So uh, just to... I guess some people have to look, go now because it's already six, but first I want to say thank you so much to Elena and Stacy both for coming and sharing your work with us and like one of them said it's very inspiring and so thank you so much for sharing and taking this time to talk to us.